In this video, I'm going to talk about the transformation rules for differential forms, which are also called covector fields. This video is mostly going to be an upgraded version of my video from my Tensors for Beginners series on covector transformation rules. So if you find this video confusing, I would highly recommend you check the link in the description and watch that video first. So if you've watched my Tensors for Beginners series, you've already learned a number of things. You've learned how we can take a vector and expand it out as linear combinations of basis vectors, where we get different components depending on which basis we use. You've also learned that to go from one set of basis vectors to another, we use the covariant transformation rule, where the forward transform takes us from the old basis to the new basis, and the backward transform takes us from the new basis to the old basis. We also learned that vector components obey the contravariant transformation rule, which is the opposite of the covariant transformation rule, where we use the backward transform to go from old components to new components, and we use the forward transform to go from new components to old components. Likewise, we also learned we can expand a covector out into linear combinations of basis covectors, and the basis covectors obey the contravariant transformation rule, while covector components obey the covariant transformation rule. Now, in this tensor calculus series, we've been discovering all these concepts all over again, but in the case of calculus. Instead of expanding individual vectors into linear combinations, we expand tangent vector fields along curves into linear combinations of vector fields using the chain rule, where these partial derivative operators are the basis vectors. We also discovered that basis vectors obey the covariant transformation rule, and vector components obey the contravariant transformation rule. And just now in the previous video, we discussed how covector fields, or differential forms, can be written out as linear combinations of these basis covector fields here. Now the remaining questions are, how do the basis covector fields transform, and how do the covector field components transform? And that's what I'll be discussing in this video. So in the last video, we went through this short argument to show that any covector field df, no matter what it is, can be broken up into linear combinations of basis covector fields. So we can expand df into a linear combination of dx and dy. But since df can be any covector field we like, that means we can also expand dr and d theta out into linear combinations of dx and dy. And these coefficients we get here are just the entries of the inverse Jacobian matrix, with the polar coordinates up top and the Cartesian coordinates on the bottom, which we can also think of as the backward transform. So because we use the inverse Jacobian, or backward transform, to go from the old basis to the new basis, these equations describe a contravariant transformation rule. So we can sum up these two equations using Einstein notation like this, where C1 and C2 are the Cartesian variables, and P1 and P2 are the polar variables. Also, another way of writing these two equations is using matrix notation. So here we use the inverse Jacobian matrix, and on the right here we have a column vector containing the basis covectors as the entries. And we put them in a column vector like this, because contravariant objects always go inside column vectors. We put contravariant things inside column vectors so that the transformation equations work out the way we want. And if I actually wrote out what these derivatives are, I'd get these formulas here. So let's check if these formulas make sense. So when it comes to the covector field dr, the covector curves are always pointing outward. We can show that this makes sense by taking a look at the x-axis, where the y value is equal to zero, and therefore the dy component, which is equal to y over r, will vanish because y is equal to zero. When we have positive x locations, we orient the curves to the right, just like with the dx covector field. But with negative x locations, we reverse the direction of the dx covector and orient to the left. We can also look at the y-axis where the x value is equal to zero, and likewise the dx component will vanish because x over r is equal to zero. Positive y locations have an upward orientation, just like dy, and negative y locations have a downward orientation, which is the opposite of dy. We can also do the same check for d theta. In the positive x locations, we get an upward orientation, just like dy here, and in the negative x locations, we get the opposite of dy, which is a downward orientation. Also, for the positive y locations, we get an orientation to the left, which is the opposite of dx, which makes sense because this component has a negative sign in front, 
and in the negative y locations, we orient toward the right, which agrees with dx here, because the two negative signs here would cancel out, giving us a positive component value. Now, moving in the other direction, if we want to build the Cartesian basis covector fields out of the polar basis covector fields, we use these coefficients here, which are the entries of the Jacobian matrix, also called the forward transform. And we can summarize these equations using Einstein notation like this. We can also write these equations in matrix notation like this, where this is the Jacobian matrix, and we put the basis covector fields in a column vector like this, since the basis covector fields are contravariant. And if we take these derivatives and write in the actual formulas, we get this matrix here. So just like before, we can check that these formulas actually make sense. Let's start by looking at the formulas for dx. Now along the x-axis, we only have the dr component, since the d theta component goes to zero. And when x is positive, we point to the right, just like dr. And when x is negative, we reverse the direction of dr, which means we're still pointing to the right. Now along the y-axis, we only use the d theta component, since the dr component goes to zero. So for positive y, we get negative d theta, and so we reverse the direction of d theta because of this minus sign, and we point to the right. For negative y values, we follow the direction of d theta, and again, we point to the right. And everywhere else in space, when we add the dr and d theta orientations and densities, the vertical densities will always cancel out to zero, and the horizontal densities will always point to the right. So we always end up with covectors pointing to the right, which is exactly what we'd expect for the dx covector field. And for the dy covector field, things are very similar. It's just that the dr and d theta covector fields will always add together in such a way that the result always points upward, which is exactly what we would expect for the dy covector field. So in summary, these are the transformation rules for the basis covector fields. And here they are again summarized in Einstein notation. Remember that this is the inverse Jacobian, or backward transform, and this is the Jacobian, or forward transform. So these match up with the contravariant transformation rule. So we figured out the transformation rule for basis covector fields, and it's the contravariant rule just like we would expect for covectors. Now let's figure out the covector component transformation rules. So here I've shown that we can expand the DF covector field using either Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates. And since these components are partial derivatives, we already know how to convert between them. We just use the multivariable chain rule. So these chain rules here give us the transformations from Cartesian to polar components. And these chain rules here give us the transformations from polar components to Cartesian components. And we can summarize these rules using the Einstein notation here. So while the basis covector fields obey the contravariant transformation rule, the covector field components obey the covariant transformation rule, going from old to new with the Jacobian and going from new to old with the inverse Jacobian. And the fact that covector components are covariant isn't very surprising. Remember that we get covector components by counting how many covector lines are pierced by the basis vectors. So in this case, the components are 2, 2, because both basis vectors pierce two stack lines each. Now, if we double the length of the basis vectors, the components end up becoming 4, 4. Because each basis vector is twice as long, it also pierces twice as many stack lines. So when basis vectors grow, covector components also grow. Covector components vary in the same way as basis vectors do, and that means that they are covariant. So now let's go through a couple concrete examples of the covariant transformation law for covector components. Recall in the last video we started talking about this scalar field f, and in Cartesian coordinates the scalar field f is given by this function here, y squared plus x minus one half. And in polar coordinates it's given by this function here, r squared sine theta squared plus r cosine theta minus one half. Now we already got the components of this covector field df in the previous video, which I've listed here, so let's see if we can confirm that the covariant transformation rule is correct for changing between these components. So this matrix here is the Jacobian, and since covector components are covariant, we put them in a row vector like this. Basically, if something is covariant, we always put it in a row on the left side of the transformation matrix if we want the equations to work out correctly. 
So let's just rewrite things using the actual variable names. And now let's substitute the formulas in for all these functions. Now we're going to want the answer to be completely in terms of polar coordinates, right? So let's just replace x with r cosine theta and we'll replace y with r sine theta. And so we get this. So we have this row vector and this matrix. And if we carry out this matrix multiplication, we get this. And if we just rearrange the order of the terms a little bit, you can see that we do indeed get the correct components for the covector field df in polar coordinates. Now let's try going in the other direction from polar components to Cartesian components. And to do this, we use the inverse Jacobian. So in matrix notation, that would look like this. Again, with the covector field components inside a row vector. And again, I'm just going to rewrite this using the actual variable names. And if we substitute in the actual formulas for the partial derivatives, we get this. Now this time we're going to want to write all the answers in Cartesian coordinates. So I'm going to simplify this as much as possible to give us x's and y's instead of r's and thetas. So cosine theta is really just equal to x over r, so I'll write these in. And sine theta is really just equal to y over r, so I'll write those in as well. And we can simplify things a little bit more by canceling out some factors of r, and we get this. Okay, so we have this matrix multiplication formula here, and it's going to take a little bit of work to churn through all this, but if you carry out the matrix multiplication, you get this. So here you can see the entries of the row vector, and they're all multiplied by one of the entries of the matrix. Now if we go through all these multiplications, we'll get this line here, and you can see that this term cancels with this, and this term cancels with this. So we're left with this simple line here, and you'll notice here I've factored out 2y from both of these terms, uh, just to make things simpler. Now here you'll notice that we get the expressions x squared plus y squared over r squared. And as you probably know, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So that means that both of these expressions will just become 1. And so finally we're left with the components 1, 2y, which is exactly what we were expecting. So we really have confirmed that these chain rule formulas for converting between covector field components really do work. We use the Jacobian or forward transform here to go from old to new, and we use the inverse Jacobian or backward transform to go from new to old, and that's just the covariant transformation rule. So finally we can fill in this last box with the covariant transformation rules for converting between covector field components. And so this marks the point where we figured out everything we need to know about vector fields and covector fields as we see them in calculus. So we've spent the last three videos working out everything we need to know about covector fields, including how to get their components and the transformation rules that they follow. In the next video, we're finally going to complete the link between the covector field interpretation of dx and the differential interpretation of dx that we see in integrals. And we're going to do that by reinterpreting what integration means.